Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are today's top stories. The Biden administration moves swiftly on getting Maryland emergency funds to deal with the Baltimore Bridge collapse, more body recovery efforts, and the accident history of the ship that struck the bridge. An emotional visit for former President Trump meeting the wife and baby of a slain NYPD officer. And President Biden meets up with former presidents Obama and Clinton for a star-studded fundraiser. More on a new record set there. Trump's lawyer is trying to get his Georgia election case dismissed as prosecutors push for trial before November. How the Fulton County judge reacted in that hearing. The Republican National Committee files a lawsuit against Michigan, accusing the state's top election official of trying to evade absentee voting procedures. FDX founder Sam Bankman-Fried sentenced to 25 years in prison for stealing billions of dollars from customers of the now bankrupt cryptocurrency exchange. A group of attorneys general suing the Biden administration. They say the president overstepped his authority in creating a new student loan forgiveness program. With Easter just around the corner, many are preparing to celebrate with chocolates and egg hunts. But what's the true meaning of the holiday? We ask New Yorkers what they think. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Today is March 29th, and we also have Congress gearing up to come to the rescue there in Baltimore. Yeah, and a top lawmaker involved in transportation matters says that a funding package could take shape in just a few weeks. Right, and that could also be for uh, the losses that are gathering because of the ports being closed down. And this is topping our news this morning. The U.S. government has awarded the state of Maryland an initial $60 million in emergency funds. The money is for clearing debris and to begin rebuilding the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Divers recovered the bodies of two men in a pickup truck near the bridge's middle span on Wednesday. Officials say they have to start clearing the wreckage before anyone can reach the bodies of four other missing workers. State police say the vehicles appear to be encased in a superstructure of concrete and other debris. You've had a chance to see the wreckage from far away. Yesterday we had a chance to see it up close. And when you have a chance to see that wreckage up close, you fully understand the enormity of the challenge. This is an incredibly complex job. And our timeline will be long. We know that there are uh, an infinite number of reasons why these things can happen. Uh, bad fuel, drop a rudder, uh, intentional acts. There's always going to be some other reason. The bridge came tumbling down early on Tuesday after a massive cargo freighter that lost power plowed into the structure in Baltimore Harbor. The ship that caused the bridge collapse was also involved in an accident in Belgium in 2016. Antwerp port authorities said the container ship named Dolly hit a wharf in July 2016 as it tried to exit the North Sea container terminal. Former President Trump's lawyers were back in Georgia yesterday, arguing in a pre-trial motion in the election interference case. Trump's team cited the First Amendment in an effort to dismiss the charges as prosecutors pushed to move the case to trial before the November election. Here's the story. All right. Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee heard arguments from a Trump lawyer that the former president's 2020 comments were protected under free speech laws. Lead attorney Steve Sadow told McAfee that Trump's concerns about the election were protected under the First Amendment, even if what he said turned out to be false. Statements, comments, speech, expressive conduct that deals with campaigning or elections has always been found to be at the zenith of protected speech. He argued that the only reason the state believes it to be unprotected is because they call it false. Some examples cited include a letter Trump addressed but never sent to Georgia Secretary of State reading, the number of false and or irregular votes is far greater than needed to change the Georgia election result. Trump also made a phone call to state election officials asserting that he won and asked them to probe election irregularities. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes. 
Prosecutor Donald Wakeford argued that Trump's statements are not protected under the First Amendment. What he is not allowed to do is employ his speech and his expression and his statements as part of a criminal conspiracy to violate Georgia's RICO statute. Trump is being charged for violating Georgia's Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO. This is a broad set of laws originally intended to be used against organized crime groups. It allows prosecutors to bunch together a seemingly unrelated series of crimes. If that can prove they were part of a wider conspiracy, Sato admitted that the RICO charges would be harder to fight on First Amendment grounds. Judge McAfee did not rule on whether he will allow Trump's indictment to stand, but he is allowing the case to move ahead. Some crimes can be achieved solely through speech, though. Why is that not what's happening here, as alleged? This is the first hearing after months of investigation into District Attorney Fonnie Willis's romantic relationship with fellow prosecutor Nathan Wade. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. Wade has since resigned from the case, while Willis was allowed to remain, though she was not in court Thursday. Willis has argued for a trial date before the November presidential election. But the hearing ended yesterday without any discussion of a potential date. And here for a breakdown of the hearing in Georgia is John Malcolm. He's the vice president of the Heritage Foundation's Institute for Constitutional Government and the director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. John, we're glad you're here to help get to the bottom of this. What is meant by core political speech that Trump's attorney argued he engaged in and therefore should have the case thrown out? Sure. Well, you have a First Amendment right to speak your mind and not have the government censor you or arrest you uh, for what it is that you say. There are exceptions to that for obscenity, speech that's designed to incite uh, immediate violence. But as a general matter, you're allowed to express your opinions. And the reason behind the First Amendment, what is most important about the First Amendment value is your ability to engage in political speech, to challenge something that the government is doing or to express your views on matters that are of public importance. And that's what Steve Sadow is saying happened here. The president uh, stated that the election uh, had been stolen. Perhaps he believed it. Maybe it was just a false statement, but he is entitled to make those statements. He can make them through the bully pulpit. He can make them on social media. He can do that by filing lawsuits to challenge the results of the election. He can do that by speaking to public officials and petitioning for a redress of grievances by asking them to investigate the matter. And that's essentially what Steve Stadow is saying the president did following the 2020 election. And for that, uh, he has been indicted. Okay, John, so please explain why Trump's attorney argues that Trump cannot be prosecuted only on the basis that his allegations about the election were quote unquote false. Well, you're allowed to make false statements. You can't do it under oath, so you can't go into court. And well, you can make a false statement, you can't tell a lie. The difference being you can say something that's wrong, you can't say something that you know is wrong at the time that you are saying it. But if you're speaking to the general public or if it's a, a court filing or you're on a radio interview, uh, you can make false statements. It may be a bad thing to do, but it's not a crime and it's protected by the First Amendment. So on that note, John, one of the main arguments that Fulton County prosecutors are making here to keep the case is that Trump lied specifically to the government. Does that change the legality of Trump's statements? If it was a lie and it was made under circumstances uh, in, in which it was you know, part of an official investigation, it can be a crime. So they will have to prove that one, it was one of those situations uh, where you know, it, it was a crime to, to make a false statement and that he knew that what he was saying at the time was not true. The government is correct that sometimes words alone can constitute uh, a crime. So if you're a fraudster and you defraud somebody through words, that's a crime. If, uh, if a, a big intimidating person were to walk up to me and stand right in front of me and say, give me your money or I'm going to beat you to a pulp, that would be a crime. Uh, but this is, it's hard to, to see that what President Trump did constitutes something like that. Yeah, and those prosecutors were looking to a parallel in the D.C. subversion case there, the election subversion case in D.C., in order to kind of bolster their arguments here. 
Should these First Amendment issues be brought up now to see if the case should be thrown out or should they be brought up to a jury during trial? Well, I don't think you can raise the legal First Amendment issue uh, in front of a jury. That is a legal question. So it's perfectly appropriate for Steve Sadow and the other uh, defense attorneys to raise the issue now to try to get the indictment dismissed. That argument has already been raised in front of Judge Tanya Chutkin, the federal judge in the District of Columbia. She has rejected it. The Supreme Court is going to consider whether to dismiss that indictment on another but somewhat related ground of presidential immunity. Uh, and we'll see what Judge uh, McAfee does. John Malcolm, Vice President of the Heritage Foundation Institute for Constitutional Government. Thank you. Good to see you. It was a busy day for presidential hopefuls. President Biden and former President Obama headlined a star-studded fundraiser with former President Bill Clinton. And former President Trump attended the wake of a New York City police officer gunned down in the line of duty. And today's Daniel Monahan has more on the two events. Former President Trump was in Massapequa, Long Island on Thursday at the wake of Officer Jonathan Diller. Diller, a three-year veteran of the force, was fatally shot below his bulletproof vest during a traffic stop on Monday in Queens. He was rushed to a hospital where he died. Two suspects have been taken into custody. Trump commented on the lengthy rap sheet of the suspected killer. We're just not going to let it happen. We just get 21 times arrested. Yes. Thug. And uh, the person in the car with him was arrested many times. And they don't learn because they don't respect, you know, they're not given the respect. The former president visited with the fallen officer's wife. Their child, brand new, beautiful baby. So we get innocent as can be and doesn't know how his life has been changed. Trump called for change, saying such deaths are happening far too often. President Biden was also in New York on Thursday. He arrived on Air Force One with his old boss, former President Barack Obama. Biden took part in a discussion with Clinton, moderated by The Late Show host Stephen Colbert, at Radio City Music Hall in front of thousands of guests. Musicians who performed included Queen Latifah, Lizzo, Ben Platt, Cynthia Erivo, and Leah Michelle. Some high-paying attendees had their pictures with the three presidents taken by celebrity photographer Annie Leibovitz. The fundraiser was punctuated by several protests inside the massive auditorium, with attendees rising at several different moments to shout over the discussion. They called out Biden's backing of Israel and its war with the Hamas terror group. One yelled, shame on you, Joe Biden. Pro-Palestinian protesters also gathered outside the event, yelling slogans like free, free Palestine and genocide Joe has got to go. At least one protester was taken into custody. Organizers say the event raised more than $25 million for Biden's re-election campaign. That's a new single event fundraising record. Tickets reportedly cost between $250 and $500,000 per person. Former President Trump will try to top that next week. Trump is inviting wealthy donors to his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, Florida. The fundraiser will take place on April 6th and will be hosted by New York hedge fund billionaire John Paulson. Guests can give over $800,000 as a chairman contributor or $250,000 per person. Those in attendance will get a personalized copy of Trump's coffee table book with photographs from his administration. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. The Republican National Committee is challenging Michigan's handling of absentee ballots. A lawsuit filed yesterday alleges Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson violated state law. It says she instructed election officials not to properly verify the identity of absentee voters. The lawsuit alleges that Benson spoke privately to elections officials and instructed them to presume the validity of the signatures without actually verifying them. The RNC filed another lawsuit against Benson earlier this month. It accused Michigan of failing to live up to the National Voter Registration Act's requirements by having more active voters on roll than adult citizens. In a previous statement to the Epic Times, Benson said that lawsuit was meritless. The RNC is also opening dozens of offices across the country and recruiting hundreds of workers over the next month. This just a few weeks after the organization hired a, fired a large portion of its staff. 
And a federal court rules this year's congressional elections in South Carolina will be held under a new electoral map. The same court previously deemed the same map unconstitutional and discriminatory against black voters. The judges explained their decision yesterday. They said there is no other plan in place right now, and with the primaries fast approaching, quote, the ideal must bend to the practical. South Carolina's primary election will be on June 11th. Voting starts in late May, but the deadline for absentee ballots is April 27th. The new district map was drawn in 2022 by state Republicans. Civil rights groups cried foul, saying it was the worst option available for black voters. They accused the makers of gerrymandering, redrawing the electoral borders to disadvantage black voters and to secure a seat for GOP candidates. Last year, a three-judge panel concluded the map unfairly exiled tens of thousands of voters. The state appealed the decision. The same panel said yesterday a lack of action from the Supreme Court meant the map would be used in the upcoming election. And stay with us. House Oversight Committee Chair James Comer invites President Biden to testify before the committee as part of an impeachment probe. How Democrats are reacting to that request. And after a violent attack in Illinois earlier this week, family and friends of four stabbing victims mourn their deaths at a vigil. That's as police are still trying to determine the suspect's motives. That and more after the break. Good to have you back. House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer has invited President Biden to testify publicly as part of the GOP's impeachment inquiry. This comes after two of Hunter Biden's former business associates testified in February. Comer yesterday suggested an April 16th hearing date, but said he could negotiate with the White House on that timing. House Oversight Chair James Comer says Americans need to hear from the president himself. He says that way, President Biden can explain why his family received tens of millions of dollars from foreign companies with his assistance. The committee says it found no legitimate services to merit such payments. In response, House Democrats called the probe comically distorted and twisted and suggested the inquiry be put to rest. The White House called Comer's invitation a sad stunt. Hunter Biden earlier testified that his father was not involved in any business dealings. And phony bomb threats against a performing arts group. A congressman says he's working with law enforcement agencies over threats made against the New York-based Shen Yun Performing Arts, a longtime target of the Chinese Communist Party. Congressman Pat Ryan says Shen Yun, their performers and their audiences deserve to feel safe and have peace of mind without any fear of violence. Over the past two weeks, Shen Yun Performing Arts and several theaters hosting its performances have received threatening emails, some written in Chinese. Ryan said his office is in close communication with both the Department of Homeland Security and FBI in the wake of the threats, which he called deeply concerning. No explosives have been found, but the threats are part of an escalating campaign by the Chinese regime to disrupt Shen Yun's performances, which portray China before communism. And a Russian court rejected American journalist Evan Gershkovich's appeal against extended detention. The Kremlin said prisoner exchange discussions for the Wall Street Journal writer are ongoing, but must be carried out in silence. The Moscow court yesterday upheld a decision by a lower court to extend Gershkovich's detention until March 30th. He has been behind bars for a year now. Russia's Federal Security Service accused Gershkovich of being a spy, a charge Gershkovich and the Wall Street Journal have denied. If convicted, Gershkovich faces up to 20 years in prison. The Kremlin has said there are ongoing negotiations regarding a potential prisoner swap that could send Gershkovich back to the U.S., but a government spokesperson said these conversations would remain secret. The Rockford, Illinois community came together yesterday to remember four people killed in a stabbing spree. The stabbings happened early Wednesday afternoon in a residential area. Mother and son Ramona and Jacob Schubach were among the victims. 
The other w victims were 15-year-old Jenna Newcomb and 49-year-old postal worker Jay Larson. The suspect, 22-year-old Christian Soto, remains in custody. Rockford police said a motive for the stabbings is yet to be determined. Soto faces four counts of murder and seven counts of attempted murder, as well as two counts of home invasion with a dangerous weapon. That's my brother. Like, right now, I don't, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to think because this whole thing is a tragedy. My dad once told me to always live so they don't have to lie at your funeral. Jay lived, nobody's got to lie about how much they loved him. She was always there to make sure that I had somebody because I didn't really know a lot of the people. So she helped like fit in. Turning now to the Francis Scott Key bridge collapse and how infrastructure like this can be protected. Please welcome Kent Harries, a professor of structural engineering and mechanics at the University of Pittsburgh. Kent, great to have you with us. NTSB Chair Hamandy said the bridge was in good condition and that its last fracture critical inspection was in 2023. What is a fracture critical inspection? Did it pass and what does it mean? Um, yeah, certainly that bridge did pass. Fracture critical is just an indication that um, that the bridge is a little bit more susceptible potentially to, to fracture um, and therefore, uh, particularly tension members, excuse me, um, and therefore we keep, a, we keep a closer eye on it. We, had, we, high, we hold it, excuse me, to a slightly higher standard um, and inspect particular aspects maybe a little bit more rigorously. Um, there were no problems that, that we're aware of, certainly with, with the, the bridge itself in this case. I see. And Kent, are there protective installations that could prevent a future disaster, such as the so-called dolphins or these bumpers that are made out of sand encased in sheet pile walls? Um, certainly. And there were, uh, there are dolphins associated with this bridge. They, they, the, the, the ship somehow navigated between them quite well. Um, by, they, they were not. Um, there was one on either side. Um, Typically, a bridge, particularly in an active port area, we'd expect more of the uh, more of a rock island or something protecting the pier. Um, even in this case, though, you've got this absolutely massive ship. Um, the, the the rock island would have to be quite robust in order to 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 have halted the the, the movement of this particular vessel. It, it, it just the pure size of it, the pure inertia involved. Um, but typically we would see rock islands, yes, or something like that. Well, thank you for revealing the presence of these dolphins here. That's new information that's surfacing here to me. There, well, you look back at 2007, there was a 700-foot container ship that struck a bridge in the San Francisco Bay Area, but that bridge was fine because they had this fendering system that was in place to absorb that shock. How many other bridges are at risk of this kind of catastrophic failure from an impact, and what can be done to protect them? Um, I don't know the numbers. I haven't looked at, at, at the, the national bridge inventory in terms of how these bridges are protected. But one of the issues that's associated with this also is just the size of the ship. Um, uh, this, this bridge, as I understand it, has also been impacted in the past, um, but by a much more modest, uh, uh, modest vessel, um, in which case it's a combination of the size of the vessel and, and the protection that's provided with these much larger, much more massive vessels with much greater inertial forces, we're going to need to provide greater protection. One of the problems with that, of course, is it starts encroaching on the navigation channel um, under existing bridges. Yeah, there's definitely an objective function to be satisfied in that case. Usually br building a tunnel is about two to three times more expensive than a bridge, and that's why we see more bridges, of course. But is it possible to build a tunnel instead of another bridge? Would that be anywhere near the price range of building a protected bridge? Um, no, I, d I don't think so. I don't think tunnels are over. Tun tunnels are generally not going to be as, as, um, as appropriate from a cost perspective. Um, and of course, they're much more susceptible to the type of uh, land that uh, is being tunneled through, the type of ground that's being tunneled through. Um, I don't know the geography in this particular area um, around Baltimore, and I don't know if a tunnel is, is, is practical or not. Um, and there are other issues with tunnels as well, they're, they're, as we saw in Boston um, many years ago. Well, Kent Harris, Professor of Structural Engineering and Mechanics at the University of Pittsburgh, thank you for weighing in. All right, thank you. 
Coming up, Kansas and 10 other states are challenging President Biden's latest student debt program. They say the administration overstepped its authority. And New York City will begin testing gun detection machines at subway stations. A series of shootings has rocked the city's transit system. More in the city's efforts to curb crime when we come back. Good to have you back. We have D David Lamb joining us now to give us some updates on, the pres on President Biden's student loan repayment plan. Yeah, David, tell us more about this. Yeah, so um, the Biden administration is getting sued over his newest, the newest debt plan. So a coalition of 11 Republic attorneys general filed the lawsuit Thursday in Kansas. They say the president's save plan is illegal because Congress didn't approve it. Now, back in 2023, the Supreme Court blocked Biden's plan to cancel $430 billion in student loan debt for about 43 million Americans. Taxpayers would have to, would have had to cover the bill. This block delivered a blow to one of Biden's campaign promises. But the president quickly rolled out a new plan, and it's scheduled to go into effect this July and cancel at least $156 billion in student debt for giving loans based on income and family size. Now, the lawsuit alleges that this $156 billion that taxpayer would have to fund is in reality just a floor, and it opens the door to a much higher amount. Kansas is leading the lawsuit along with other states, including Texas, Utah, Alaska, and Iowa. Right, actually a lot of uh, criticism surrounding that. Some even say that what's being done was in they introduced more legal errors into the rules, legal analysis, and in reality, nothing changed. But anyway, that po possibly more to come on that. Let's move on to Boeing. They have another investigation opening up. So tell us more about that one. Right, yeah, so with Boeing, um, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton uh, has opened up an investigation into one of Boeing's part suppliers, Spirit Aero Systems Holdings. The company makes the fuselages for several Boeing 737 models. His office alleged yesterday that there are reoccurring issues with some parts that the company makes, leading to several high-profile incidents in the past weeks. In March, the Federal Aviation Administration found Spirit Aero Systems Holdings and Boeing failed to meet quality control standards several times. Well, yeah, and Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, he's saying that the risks associated with some of these plane models are deeply concerning and life-threatening to Texans. Very serious. What's going on in Georgia, though? Yeah, so in Georgia, lawmakers gave final approval to a new bill, and it would ban social media on school devices. It would also require education from schools on social media and Internet use. The bill will now go to the governor's desk to either be signed into law or vetoed. If passed, Georgia will join a number of other states like Louisiana, Texas, and Utah that passed similar laws last year, mm -hmm. requiring parental consent for kids to be on social media. Now, Florida recently passed a law banning social media accounts for children under 14, regardless of par parental consent. Well, well, that sounds like a big step, but also that means that by 2025, that's what the bill says, right, um, social media services would have to use that's a quote, commercially, commercially reasonable efforts to uh, verify somebody's age. So that's coming towards us. Thank you so much. NTD's David Lam, I appreciate your time today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, David. And it's official. The impeachment trial of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas will head to the Senate on April 11th. On that date, senators will be sworn in as jurors, according to a statement from Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's office. Senate President Pro Temp Patty Murray will also preside over the matter. Mayorkas was impeached by the House last, late last month, last month by a slim margin, and that makes him the first cabinet secretary to be impeached in nearly half a century. He faces two counts, failing to comply with and enforce existing law and a breach of public trust. House Speaker Mike Johnson said Mayorkas' handling of the southern border justifies a removal from office. But the Democrat-controlled Senate is unlikely to convict him. Immigration into the U.S. reportedly rising much faster than the Biden administration expected. A new report shows we've already hit numbers the government projected we'd see decades down the road. NTD's Arian Pastar has more on the ongoing crisis. The Center for Immigration Studies published a new report on Thursday. 
It shows that the total number of immigrants in the U.S. now stands at over 50 million. That's 15.5 percent of the total population. Now, that's significant because just in November, the Biden administration projected that this 15.5 percent mark would only be reached in 2039. The center estimates that 25 percent of all immigrants, almost 13 million, are in the U.S. illegally. The report states that the most recent influx under Biden has implications for nearly every aspect of American society, including public coffers, the labor market, schools, hospitals, and the balance of political power. And we've already seen this impact in cities across the U.S. This issue will destroy New York City. Earlier this month, I spoke with Todd Bensman, a senior fellow with the Center for Immigration Studies. He then said that some towns near Mexico have already seen some of the implications outlined in this new report. You know, if they feel sick or they have a problem or cancer or whatever it is, we'll go straight into the local hospitals. They don't have insurance and, you know, hospital systems have to pay for that. Even and if it's a serious illness such uh, as cancer? paying for everything. Yeah, really? everything. Bensman says none of the waves we've seen before can be compared to the masses of immigrants coming to the U.S. now. These are just volcanic eruptions of humanity that far exceed anything that anybody down here has ever seen or experienced before. And also for the most prolonged period of time, years, three years of it straight. At present, the number of immigrants in the U.S. is higher than at any point in history. The center expects the total number to rise to 60 million after a possible second Biden term. Arian Pastar, NTD News. New York City will begin testing gun detecting technology in a pilot program at several subway stations. The announcement comes after several shootings on the subway system. Mayor Eric Adams announced yesterday that the NYPD will soon begin testing portable scanning machines at several stations. City law requires a 90-day notice period for the introduction of new surveillance technology. Adams, a former police officer, said this was the next step in keeping the New York City transit system safe. Police have seized 19 guns from people in the transit system so far this year, compared with nine guns in the same period in 2023. The Legal Aid Society, which defends New Yorkers who cannot afford lawyers, called the plan misguided and an invasion of privacy. An attorney with the organization said gun detection systems are flawed and frequently trigger false alarms, which could induce panic. Nearly 4 million trips are made on the city's subway on a typical workday, weekday, and New York State banned people from having guns in what it designates as sensitive locations, including public transportation in 2022. The ruling is being challenged by gun rights advocates. Well, the city's really cracking down on that gun violence. Right, as we have heard previously from the chief, right, there is quite a bit of transit system crim crime going on, and I'm sure... Um, New Yorkers want to feel safer and actually put both of those earplugs in when they listen to music in the subway. Yeah, and if they can find a way to knock down those false alarms, that could be right. one method that can help. That's right. All right. We're going to break here. FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed sentenced to 25 years in prison for stealing billions of dollars from customers of the now bankrupt cryptocurrency exchange. And today's Business Matters host, Don Ma, joins us to discuss. Chocolate shops are getting ready for Easter amid rising cocoa prices. One chocolate artisan in Belgium says customers are still buying the sweet treat despite higher costs. That and more after the break. Thanks for staying with us. And joining us now is host of NTD's Business Matters, Don Ma, to give us the latest updates from the financial world. Don, tell us more about what's happening with FTX founder. Yeah, so yeah, we have to talk about that since he was sentenced uh, yesterday. And if we have time, I'll also like to mention some changes to taxes and as well as inflation when it comes to Dollar Tree and chocolate. So let me start with Bankman Freed. So he was once known as, of course, uh, the crypt uh, cryptocurrency whiz kid, and he was sentenced 25 years, uh, as you mentioned earlier. Um, so Bankman Freed was found guilty of seven counts of fraud and conspiracy in November. Uh, during the sentencing, he did apologize for his actions yesterday, uh, saying that, quote, uh, it haunts me uh, every day. 
So prosecutors say that the 32-year-old ran the FTX cryptocurrency exchange into the ground while lining his own pockets. Uh, so Bankman Fried, uh, uh, as we all know, was the CEO at the time, and he says he made numerous bad decisions, which cost customers lots of money. Analysts call the FTX collapse one of the largest white-collar crimes of all time. And Bankman Fried did face up to 110 years in prison, but prosecutors looked for roughly half that amount. Right, and now I guess we just wait and see if they actually will, like they said they would, um, appeal the conviction and the sentence. But let's move on to taxes. Many people probably just finished filing their 2023 taxes, but what are some changes to expect for 2024 taxes? Sure, so filing taxes as a freelancer next year will require some more paperwork. Uh, and the IRS hopes that this will improve reporting overall. Now, this applies to independent and self-employed workers, as well as businesses that sell online and receive payments from, uh, you know, apps like uh, Venmo, Zelle, Cash App, or PayPal. So this year, uh, gig workers and small businesses will still have to use 1099K forms to report third-party app payments totaling $20,000 and payments over $200. This threshold will be lowered though uh, next year to $5,000. So the main difference here for the 2024 tax year uh, will be payment platforms issuing additional forms for every purchase transaction. So if you do get a form by mistake, the IRS says that uh, just contact the company or just simply put 1099K received in error on your taxes. Right, really good to know. So let's move on to Dollar Tree really quick. You, you've, they've been talking about, you know, you've, you've been here to talk about the, some of the financial struggles they have. So the dollar stores have always carried items more than $1, but it's never been more than a few bucks. Do we expect that to change soon? I know they had their early earnings call recently, so tell me more about that. Yeah, unfortunately, it is going to change. And what the change is that it's raising the maximum price on store items from $5 to $7 here. Oh. So a $2 increase. And the CEO shared the change uh, in an earnings call earlier this month. He said the price increase is due to a wealthier custom, customer base. That's what he's saying. He says that the retailer's fastest growing demographic is people who actually earn six figures. Now, I didn't know that. He says $125,000 a year. So three years ago, the company raised the base price of items to $1.25. Uh, this past June is set a new cap at $5, and Dollar Tree reported a net loss of more than $1.7 billion in the quarter ending February 3rd. Uh, in response, it announced plans to close nearly 1,000 stores. You get, really got to wonder why higher income people are shopping at dollar stores. Maybe it's the inflation. I don't know. But the CEO says that it's going to be food, pet products, and personal care products that are going to see that price hike. Let's move on, though, Don. With Easter around the corner, how are chocolate prices looking? Uh, yeah, so it seems like uh, it's, it's not good news here either. So not even the Easter Bunny, it seems like, uh, can't escape inflation this year. Uh, you can expect your Easter basket to cost a lot more. That's because chocolate prices are surging and experts say uh, it's only going to get worse. Retail chocolate prices rose over 11% in 2023 and cocoa futures are up 250%. From last March. So experts are pointing to adverse weather conditions, crop diseases in West Africa, and by the way, that's where 70% of the world's cocoa is produced. Uh, so to combat uh, rising costs and dwindling supply, many candy companies are touting other options to fill out Easter baskets. So in 2023, non-chocolate and gummy candy saw a 12% increase, uh, unfortunately. Our chocolate price, it's getting serious, guys. Well, well, not even the chocolate prices. Anyway, hopefully people don't let that spoil their Easter. But thank you so much, Don Ma, host of NTD, oh, NTD's Business Matters. Thank you. Thanks. And Belgian chocolate shops are getting ready for Easter amidst rising cocoa prices on global markets. Although prices have skyrocketed, the tradition of buying and eating chocolate is still popular. Patricia Lafargue, a chocolate artisan at the Belgian Chocolate Makers, said she hadn't noticed any changes in customers' behavior, with Easter and Christmas still the busiest time of the year for her store. 
For us, the price increase will not change much for the time being because we are working with small farmers. Our cacao does not come from deforestation, so the impact for us will not be as big as it will be for industrial companies who have cacao coming only from deforestation. It is crystal clear that chocolate will become again a very, very, very luxury product with the soaring prices. For us, we were already more expensive than industrial chocolate makers because we are small artisans. Everything here is 100% handmade and we are using quality cacao coming from small producers. So it comes with the cost, but here you are buying a quality product made with artisanal work. The Belgian chocolate makers also offers customers the opportunity to create their own chocolate bar. During these chocolate making sessions, customers can learn about the different types of chocolate and discover how the taste of chocolate varies depending on the origin of the cocoa beans. Okay, if I could make my own chocolate bar, it would totally be a sword. It would be a sword? Yeah. Oh, and it would be so beautiful that you didn't even have to eat it because you don't eat chocolate, right? Yeah, maybe if it's white chocolate. Oh, a white okay. sword. Oh, wow. That so cool. sounds, that, yeah, that sounds almost magical. All right. <laughs> with Easter just around the corner, many are preparing to celebrate with chocolates and egg hunts. But what's the true meaning of the holiday? Hear what New Yorkers have to say after the break. Welcome back. This weekend, many families are celebrating Easter. Is the meaning of Easter changing for people though? The most important Christian holiday is just around the corner. Chris Beers went out to ask how people view the holiday these days. Take a look. Easter is coming up this Sunday, but what is the true meaning of Easter? This pivotal Christian holiday lives on in an increasingly secular world. What do people in New York City have to say about it? I spoke with some of them. What does Easter mean to you? Um, well, I was raised Catholic, and so it's a great celebration for me. And it's a time where I reflect on how I've been behaving with people. How, I, if I'm satisfied with that, do I want to make changes? It's a time of reflection. It means memory. It means uh, hope. It means uh, redemption. Normally, Easter means to me spending time with your family. It means more to me than Christmas, actually. It's uh, huge. Uh, I'm Catholic, so yeah, I think the whole religion of Catholicism is based on what happens in Easter. So uh, it means a lot, yeah. So what does Easter mean to you? Savior of humanity. It's uh, sinful man being um, reconciled with God. Uh, Easter means everything. For, for me, Easter is a great family time. Uh, I celebrate Greek Easter, uh, which is actually not till May this year. Usually there's a one week difference between regular, what we call regular Easter and Greek Easter. This year it's more like a couple of months. Um, but it's great, you know, there's a combination of a spiritual time, but also a great family time where we get together and celebrate with relatives who we don't typically see. Easter for us is kind of our Persian New Year. So we have a Persian New Year that's the first day of uh, the spring day. So that's what kind of Easter kind of reminds me of that as well too. And we celebrate by, again, you know, as we say before, we kind of clean the houses, we bring up, put greens up, we have, you know, everything that we wear is brand new, showing it's a festive new year. So we get to put it you know, out with the old and in with the new. Do you feel like the meaning of this Christian holiday Easter has changed uh, over the years? Oh, immensely. It's not any longer a Christian holiday. It's something the Americans made up, which is like bunnies and rabbits. I don't get it. I really do not get it. Yes, it's changed. I think as America has gotten like less, maybe less religious and just as spiritual, it's changed, right? Like less people are going to church in America than had maybe even 20 years ago. Yeah, I feel like uh, I, I do think that Easter is kind of undervalued. I think. Uh, as time has gone on, people don't value as much as they should. You know, we live in a society that's obsessed with things, money, uh, lusting after uh, things of the world, and at the end of the day, none of that goes with you. So hopefully it's an opportunity for people to renew their faith in, in God. And what's the true meaning of Easter in your words? of Christ, defeating death, life through Christ for everybody who believes in Him. 
yeah, God is risen, right? Jesus Christ is risen. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, it really is like a true celebration. The true meaning of Easter, well, according to Christians, it's the, the, the fact that Jesus is risen and died for our sins. I think there's a broader meaning in that um, there's hope and renewal. So there you have it, what Easter means to people today in the words of a handful of folks we met in New York City. Chris Beers, NTD News. Wow, he certainly found some inspiring people out there. Yeah. But also, just quickly, because I, I was wondering about the, the rabbit and egg thing in Easter. And apparently, so the symbol of the rabbit stems from, that I'm reading from Time Magazine now, stems from a pagan tradition. So that basically stands for, um, it was the, the, the symbol for the goddess of fertility, and her symbol was the bunny. Ah, well. It's interesting where this stems from, yeah. There's a big dichotomy between paganism and Christianity, so there's right. a little little tension going right, on there. Right. And it's shaping up to be a really busy weekend for travel, so many people can celebrate Easter in the way that they do. Right, yeah. Also, yeah, so get out of the house early so you're on time. <laughs> All right, um, we are going to head to a quick break now, but we'll be right back with more, so stay with us. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. So there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are today's top stories. The Biden administration moves swiftly on getting Maryland emergency funds to deal with the Baltimore Bridge collapse. More on body recovery efforts and the accident history of the ship that struck the bridge. An emotional visit for former President Trump meeting the wife and baby of a slain NYPD officer. And President Biden meets up with former Presidents Obama and Clinton for a star-studded fundraiser. More on a new record set there. Trump's lawyer is trying to get his Georgia election case dismissed as prosecutors push for trial before November. How the Fulton County judge reacted in that hearing. House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer invites President Biden to testify as part of the impeachment inquiry. He says Americans need to hear from the president. Democrats call the move twisted. New York City will begin testing gun detection machines at subway stations. That's as a series of shootings has rocked the city's transit system. Have you ever wondered, is there more to life after death? We explore this with the best-selling author of Evidence of the Afterlife and other books. Artisans are keeping local Easter traditions alive in Bosnia, including hand-painted Easter eggs and the art of egg shoeing. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Welcome, everyone. Today is Friday, March 29th. Happy Friday, everyone. And to topping today's news, the U.S. government has awarded the state of Maryland an initial $60 million in emergency funds. The money is for clearing debris and to begin rebuilding the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Divers recovered the bodies of two men in a pickup truck near the bridge's middle span on Wednesday. 
Officials say they have to start clearing the wreckage before anyone can reach the bodies of four other missing workers. State police say the vehicles appear to be encased in a superstructure of concrete and other debris. You've had a chance to see the wreckage from far away. Yesterday we had a chance to see it up close. And when you have a chance to see that wreckage up close, you fully understand the enormity of the challenge. This is an incredibly complex job, and our timeline will be long. We know that there are uh, an infinite number of reasons why these things can happen. Uh, bad fuel, drop a rudder, uh, intentional acts. There's always going to be some other reason. The bridge came tumbling down early on Tuesday after a massive cargo freighter that lost power plowed into the structure in Baltimore Harbor. The ship that caused the bridge collapse was also involved in an accident in Belgium in 2016. Antwerp Port Authorities said the container ship named Dolly hit a wharf in July 2016 as it tried to exit the North Sea Container Terminal. The collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland will cause shipping companies to divert their freight to nearby ports in New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Virginia. We learn more about the impact that will have and the overall strain the catastrophe will put on the U.S. economy from supply chain expert Lisa Anderson, the president of LMA Consulting Group Incorporated. Well, there'll be delays and congestion for a few weeks. Uh, however, they'll be able to absorb them relatively quickly, uh, given our past supply chain challenges. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And now with this bridge down, that means that the 5,000 trucks that normally cross over this bridge each day are going to have to be diverted. And I mean, they're carrying $28 billion worth of goods each year, and they might not be able to go through some of these tunnels because of dimension constraints and hazmat constraints. Are there going to be significant delays and added costs associated with that? Definitely. Uh, there's the region is going to be greatly impacted uh, between, um, you know, have, losing access to the port, uh, the transportation uh, delays. They'll have to re be rerouted, uh, you know, longer distances. If they come from other ports, they'll have to be transported in. So that it'll definitely add significant uh, delays in costs uh, for the region. Yeah, and this is such an important port considering that there's $80 million, according to the state of Maryland, of goods that pass through that. And now this is going to cause probably the West Coast to have to take on an extra load and have these shippers divert to there. And then maybe they have to use train or truck to get those goods out to the East Coast then? Exactly. Uh, now that uh, you know, we've, we've been through a lot of supply chain challenges between the drought in the Panama Canal to the Houthi rebels in the, with the Suez Canal and now uh, with the bridge collapse. So now the next best option is to have uh, freight go to the West Coast ports and then rail or transport across uh, to the East Coast. You're absolutely right. It's going to add, could easily add additional time and cost uh, to those uh, shipments. Can you make a comparison here as to how this compares to, say, the Ever Given crashing in the Suez Canal, for example? Well, it's the good news is that, you know, from a transportation standpoint, is that it's not as um, significant because it's not going to cause the entire waterway to be, you know, impassable uh, for, uh, you know, however long. Uh, it'll affect mainly the Baltimore port. However, uh, it will, you know, as we divert uh, product uh, to the other ports and then eventually divert them to the West Coast ports and add costs to the, uh, to the uh, you know, transportation, it'll definitely impact things, but it's not gonna be as significant of a choke point as the, the evergreen that got stuck in the Suez Canal. That is some good news surrounding this. Are there going to be impacts to the American economy as a result? Well, I mean, you know, it's this alone is not going to, you know, increase inflation by 20 percent in the U.S. economy or something, but it is going to have uh, impacts to the regional economy and it will have a slight impact. Uh, on the uh, U.S. economy because, you know, the more disruptions, delays, uh, congestion, reroutes, and um, added cost uh, will add up and it will impact uh, overall inflation. It certainly is gonna impact certain industries like the auto industry in specifically in that region. 
because uh, the port is known for uh, um, roll on, roll off, which is in essence like uh, goods like cars and light trucks. And it'll impact uh, like coal uh, because it's impacted for that, or the port is also known for that type of a commodity. So it'll impact certain uh, commodities and industries, which will have, you know, uh, slight impacts in the U.S. economy. Lisa Anderson, supply chain expert and president of LMA Consulting Group Incorporated. Thank you for the update. Glad to be here. It was a busy day for presidential hopefuls. President Biden and former President Obama headlined a star-studded fundraiser with former President Bill Clinton. And former President Trump attended the wake of a New York City police officer gunned down in the line of duty. And today's Daniel Monahan has more on the two events. Former President Trump was in Massapequa, Long Island on Thursday at the wake of Officer Jonathan Diller. Diller, a three-year veteran of the force, was fatally shot below his bulletproof vest during a traffic stop on Monday in Queens. The former president visited with the fallen officer's wife. The child, brand new, beautiful baby, so we get innocent as can be and doesn't know how his life has been changed. Trump called for change, saying such deaths are happening far too often. President Biden was also in New York on Thursday. He arrived on Air Force One with his old boss, former President Barack Obama. Biden took part in a discussion with Clinton, moderated by The Late Show host Stephen Colbert, at Radio City Music Hall in front of thousands of guests. Pro-Palestinian protesters also gathered outside the event, yelling slogans like, Free, Free Palestine! And Genocide Joe has got to go! At least one protester was taken into custody. Organizers say the event raised more than $25 million for Biden's re-election campaign. That's a new single event fundraising record. Tickets reportedly cost between $250 and $500,000 per person. Former President Trump will try to top that next week. Trump is inviting wealthy donors to his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, Florida. Guests can give over $800,000 as a chairman contributor or $250,000 per person. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Meanwhile, former President Trump's lawyers were back in Georgia yesterday arguing in a pretrial motion in the election interference case. Trump's team cited the First Amendment in an effort to dismiss the charges as prosecutors pushed to move the case to trial before the November election. Here's the story. All right. Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee heard arguments from a Trump lawyer that the former president's 2020 comments were protected under free speech laws. Lead attorney Steve Sadow told McAfee that Trump's concerns about the election were protected under the First Amendment, even if what he said turned out to be false. Statements, comments, speech, expressive conduct that deals with campaigning or elections has always been found to be at the zenith of protected speech. He argued that the only reason the state believes it to be unprotected is because they call it false. Some examples cited include a letter Trump addressed but never sent to Georgia Secretary of State reading, the number of false and or irregular votes is far greater than needed to change the Georgia election result. Trump also made a phone call to state election officials asserting that he won and asked them to probe election irregularities. All I want to do is this. I just want to find... Uh, 11,780 votes. Prosecutor Donald Wakeford argued that Trump's statements are not protected under the First Amendment. Judge McAfee did not rule on whether he will allow Trump's indictment to stand, but he is allowing the case to move ahead. Some crimes can be achieved solely through speech, though. Why is that not what's happening here, as alleged? This is the first hearing after months of investigation into District Attorney Fannie Willis's romantic relationship with fellow prosecutor Nathan Wade. Willis has argued for a trial date before the November presidential election, but the hearing ended yesterday without any discussion of a potential date. Coming up, New York City will begin testing gun detection machines at subway stations. That's as a series of shootings has rocked the city's transit system. Hand painting eggs and the ancient art of egg shoeing, how two Bosnian artisans are keeping these Easter traditions alive. 
The Las Vegas Police Department throws a birthday party for comfort dog Jimmy. He's turning two years old. Join the pooch party when we come back. Welcome back. House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer has invited President Biden to testify publicly as part of the GOP's impeachment inquiry. This comes after two of Hunter Biden's former business associates testified in February. Comer yesterday suggested an April 16th hearing date, but said he could negotiate with the White House on that timing. House Oversight Chair James Comer says Americans need to hear from the president himself. He says that way, President Biden can explain why his family received tens of millions of dollars from foreign companies with his assistance. The committee says it found no legitimate services to merit such payments. In response, House Democrats called the probe comically distorted and twisted and suggested the inquiry be put to rest. The White House called Comer's invitation a sad stunt. Hunter Biden earlier testified that his father was not involved in any business dealings. New York City will begin testing gun detecting technology in a pilot program at several subway stations. The announcement comes after several shootings on the subway system. Mayor Eric Adams announced yesterday that the NYPD will soon begin testing portable scanning machines at several stations. City law requires a 90-day notice period for the introduction of new surveillance technology. An attorney with the Legal Aid Society said gun detection systems are flawed and frequently trigger false alarms, which could induce panic, leading to loss of life. Police have seized 19 guns from people in the transit system so far this year, compared with nine guns in the same period in 2023. And today is Good Friday, which commemorates the crucif crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And of course, Easter celebrates his resurrection three days later. So perhaps many of us have wondered, is there something more after death? Paul Perry, a filmmaker and best-selling author, says yes. He wrote several books on this topic, so we're bringing him in now to explore what he found. Good morning, Paul. I'm excited to hear what you have to tell us about this. So you have spent so much time exploring this topic and speaking with people um, that had um, near-death experiences or they say they had. So to me, it almost sounds inconceivable. So what are some of the common <laughs> things you hear about what that experience is like and what is happening to them? What happens to them? Well, a near-death experience obviously occurs at the point of a near-death. And uh, typically what happens is, is immediate. Let's say a person has a trauma and they go to an emergency room and their heart stops, which is really the, the gold standard of uh, the near-death experience. So they will, then, they, they will then have a sense of being dead. They, they know they're dead and they will often leave their bodies and go above the doctor, for instance, who was, who was working on them to keep them alive. Uh, they leave their body. They're able to recount conversations that they hear, what they see, the instruments, the medical instruments the doctors and nurses are using. And then uh, a series of events take place, generally speaking. They, they have a life review. They see dead relatives. They, they tend to go up a tunnel toward a light or a being of light. And that's where a lot of the action takes place. Uh, this being of light is with them when they have their life review. And they talk to you, they counsel you. And this all takes place in a matter of sometimes seconds, sometimes several minutes. But when it is over, the person is totally transformed. So that's very interesting. Um, it almost sounds like something, you know, out of the movie. So is, there, is that usually what people tell you? Is it always um, the sequence of events? Or is there any story, you know, that especially stood out to you? Well, it's not always a sequence of events, but it always has the same the same elements in it. Sometimes a person will experience, they'll have what's called a full near-death experience, where they have an out-of-body experience. They can go into another room, and later they can recount what they saw in another room. Uh, and that's and then the the being of light 
that is very transformative. That's these are common near death experiences. Right. So always somewhat uh, similar. But have you been skeptical when you first came across somebody that told you this? I know you co-authored a book on possible scientific explanations, for instance. So tell right. me more about what you found there and why you went into this. Well, I was uh, I was an editor for American Health Magazine. I was the executive editor for American Health Magazine, which was the most successful magazine startup of the, of the 1980s. And I had never, someone talked to me about near-death experiences, and I'd never really heard of them. And uh, so I was asked to write a book with Dr. Raymond Moody, who is the person who named and defined the near-death experience. And uh, uh, we wrote that book, and I just became very curious about near-death experiences, what wasn't written about yet, what, what vacuums, in this area needed to be filled. And uh, so I started writing books about it. At first, I didn't believe it. I was kind of like you. I can see it'll be fairly skeptical. But uh, uh, this isn't something invented by Hollywood. This is something that is, in my estimation, first recorded uh, by Plato in Plato's Republic. There's He talks about a, a near-death experience there. He doesn't call it that. The near name near death experience didn't come around until 1976, but uh, but there were death experiences that are similar to the ones that uh, I've investigated for all these years. Well, actually, I mean, I've now written I've now written 15 books on this subject, uh, five of them New York Times bestsellers, and all of them except for for uh, one were written with medical doctors. Because my skepticism is the same as yours, is is that uh, I, I want to I, if I'm going to write a book about it, I want to deal with the people who have studied the human body, who are medical doctors, who have seen everything you can see in an emergency room, and they still see near death experiences and they believe them. Well, I think that's very interesting, especially that you went years and years doing more research and with medical personnel, um, and that you. Come, still come to this uh, conclusion. I wish we had so much more time to talk about this, but unfortunately yeah. we're running out of time. Paul Perry, I appreciate your coming on this morning. Well, thank you very much, Evelyn. So with Easter approaching, some artisans in Bosnia are keeping their traditional crafts alive for another year. One woman decorates her Easter eggs by hand using ink and get this, beeswax. Another is an expert in the 14th century art of egg shoeing. Let's look at these unique and ancient crafts. Generations of know-how and over 60 years of practice. That's what it takes to decorate Easter eggs by hand that look this good. Her mother showed Miroslava Ivicevic the technique as a little girl. She's kept it alive ever since. Each year in the run-up to Easter, she sits at her kitchen table, carefully adorning each egg in beeswax. The women who came before us were resourceful. They did not have different dyes to choose from. They did not have many ornaments. But they had honeybees, and they had beeswax from combs, which they themselves melted. So they used that for decoration, because when you apply beeswax to an egg, what you draw with it will never wash away. The 70-year-old has developed her own style over time, and many of her designs incorporate symbols related to Bosnia. But she says there are no rules when it comes to egg decorating. You let your imagination run free. The only important thing is that the eggs be beautiful and nicely decorated. Nearby, another local artisan is also hard at work. Stjepan Bilatek and a handful of others still practice the 14th century art of egg shoeing. Bilatek is the oldest and most experienced practitioner in his field. He has a deep knowledge of the history of this unusual craft. He says it was developed as a way of testing blacksmith apprentices. Shopmasters agreed what to do and they informed their apprentices that they consider them fit to start their own shops once they managed to shoe an egg. A commission of masters would be established to inspect these eggs to see if they cracked or not. If the eggs cracked, apprentices had to take the test again. If not, if their eggs were accepted by the commission, the eggs were considered to be their graduation diploma. People treasure his work and value the eggs as gifts. 
One of his eggs can last hundreds of years if it remains unbroken. Especially around Easter, more people come to buy eggs for presents. Once the holidays are over and they go back to places where they live, they take these eggs with them as gifts. During the 1990s, war in Bosnia displaced hundreds of local residents to other countries. Now it's a tradition for former residents to return to the town each spring to celebrate Easter and buy traditional gifts to take home. And happy birthday, Jimmy. He's a comfort dog with the Las Vegas Police Department. Happy birth... <laughs> no, <laughs> he's turning two years old, so the department threw a big party to celebrate, complete with hats, balloons, and a cake. Jimmy has only been with the department for a year, but has already made hundreds of visits to people across the Las Vegas area. Oh, it looks like a Labradoodle over there. Yeah. And he's there to help people recover from traumatic events or just bring a smile to everyone he meets. Yeah, it just looks like he has not, he has all, also made hundreds of friends as it looks like. What a friendly little dog. Yeah, they're really getting along. And, and the department says that Jimmy's part of that Employee Health, Wellness and Safety Bureau. Oh, yeah. well, so he's also doing important work. <laughs> he's really getting into that cake. Look at him chomping down on that cake. Are those <laughs> dog treats in the cake? <laughs> you gotta wonder. All right. Yeah. Well, it certainly looks delicious to him. And Labradoodles, you know, according to EmotionalPetSupport.com, are highly intelligent, and that means they're quick learners, which makes them perfect as service dogs. Yeah, that's awesome. Apparently, he was donated, right? So somebody was had some thought behind that. Yeah. All right. Um, we're wrapping up our show right here, but be sure to stay tuned for Entities News Today broadcast at 11 a.m. Eastern Time coming up. And for round-the-clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan.